Hi, and welcome to Excelsior Classes. My name is Julie Rohr, and you're about to see a presentation given by Lieutenant Colonel Jean Doremus. Jean is one of our teachers here at Excelsior, and as a man that I know personally, I know that he is a lifelong learner and a fascinating teacher. He has taught kids online, but he's also taught in the public school. He's taught adult Bible studies. He has taught at a university level, teaching at Cal State University. And he served our military for many years in the Air Force. We are excited that you can enjoy one of the topics that he loves, which is space. During this session, he will talk about the astronomy of the Bible, a very old book you'll find out about. We also had many participants during this session that were former or current students of his, so he has a great rapport with them, as you'll see. Towards the end of this presentation, we gave away two copies of the book that Jean is about to tell you about. In the future, if you would like to join us for any upcoming Excelsior webinars, you can go to our page, excelsiorclasses.com, and look up here in the Parent Resources tab. If you hit that and it drops down, you'll see a link for any live webinars that might be coming up, as well as times and dates. Also below that on the page, if you scroll down, you'll see a catalog of all of our past webinar presentations. You are certainly welcome to enjoy any one of those, and we hope you'll find them as fascinating as we did. Now, without further ado, let me turn this presentation over to Jean with our session already in progress. And some of you have seen, it, you know, because I do teach most of this, particular thing in uh, in my astronomy class. So it's kind of a teaser if you haven't taken my astronomy class. So all the heavens declare the glory of God, don't they? And we know that scripture verse pretty well. Uh, but this will be a slightly different take on that, but uh, still uh, allowing the heavens to declare the glor glory of God. Okay, so I told you that this was going to be a book report. And the author of the book is called Walter Maunder. Walter Maunder, and here's a little bit about him on this slide. He worked for the Royal Observatory. He's a British guy. And it, it's kind of cool too that you'll notice that he, uh, well, I don't have a mouse, but you notice that uh, his employment dates has got a three year break in it. Uh, why would there be a three year break in those employment dates? Uh, and some of you probably are thinking real fast, but uh, I'll give you the answer World War I. He actually went off and enlisted in World War I. Um, but I don't think he saw any action. By the time he got trained and everything, the war was over uh, or near over, and he didn't do it. Okay, so just a, a smart guy uh, working in the British Observatory uh, in London, and you can see the eight the years that he lived there up until uh, 1928. Okay, next slide. So Walter Maunder is actually quite famous, uh, and you would think, how much do you <laughs> A, an astronomer from a hundred years ago, think about how much we've learned since then. You'd think that some astronomer from a hundred years ago would be out of the science books. In fact, I don't even have it with me. Here's my uh, college, my college uh, astronomy book, and guess who's in there? Walter Maunder, a guy from a hundred years ago. So that's just giving you a clue uh, how great he was. Uh, he did a couple things. His, his, his expertise was tracking sunspots. And so uh, the, the chart on the bottom, I'm used to having a mouse, and most of my students know that I can hardly talk without a, without a mouse, but the, the, uh, without my pen. But the chart on the bottom is him, is him charting sunspots along the equator of the sun, and it ended up being called the butterfly effect. And so it, usually the chart is pretty long and it just looks like a whole bunch of butterflies. And so he's pretty famous uh, for what they call the butterfly effect, attracting sunspots on each side of the equator. But he's also, and I don't know how he did this, but he was able to track, to, I don't know if there must have been something in the archives or something, he was able to track sunspots back for 400 years. Uh, and he charted them all out. And what's pretty cool is you can see on the chart there, uh, back in the 1650 to say 1730, there was a lot fewer sunspots. And guess what? 
the temperature on planet Earth, especially the Northern Hemisphere, was very cold. In fact, it's called the mini ice age. And uh, the Earth was much cooler then. Some of you, if you probably don't know a Little House on the Prairie, <laughs> when I first heard about the, the mini ice age, I thought a Little House on the Prairie and how cold it was out there in Kansas. Uh, so we had real cold temperatures back in the uh, around 1650 up into the 1700s, uh, colder than normal. And then you can see as the sunspots increase, uh, our temperatures have gone up. And so this slide, I don't want to get too political here, but uh, I know, I, I'm not a big global, I, I believe in global warming and I think there is global warming. I just don't think that man is responsible for it, nor do I think that man is going to fix it. And so I'm not on this global warming kick other than to say that now the sunspots, the sunsets have been high for a while, a lot of them for a while, and we've experienced some warming, and now the sunspots are getting lower, and, uh, <laughs> and I think the earth is going to cool down all by itself without any help from us uh, using windmills and solar power. Okay, enough on that. But the point of this uh, slide is to show you that he's, he's a famous scientist that made his mark in the astronomy world, and he's still in modern day college textbooks. That's how smart and famous he was. But he was also an evangelical Christian, uh, a, a believer in Jesus Christ as his savior, and a Bible, a Bible scholar in his own right. So near, uh, somewhere near the end of his life, he wrote a book, he, he put a book together called uh, The Astronomy of the Bible. And it's a pretty deep read. And of course, people that wrote 100 years ago seem to have written deep, deeper anyway. And uh, it's, it's a little on the difficult side. You have to read it pretty carefully and pretty slowly. And I just want to share a few things that he put in, he, in this book, uh, The Astronomy of the Bible. And some of my, and I've actually used it in my astronomy class. My astronomy students read, I don't know, maybe a chapter, maybe two chapters uh, of this book. And it's a pretty, pretty good sized book. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So everything I'm going to say from now on is n almost none of it comes from me. Everything I'm about to tell you is uh, almost everything, except for this slide here, is uh, <laughs> it comes, comes out of this book, The Astronomy of the Bible. So let's have a few, real quick, Constellation 101, some basic stuff. If you don't know it, you need to know it. Number one, the constellations are all these pictures in the sky, but they are not connect the dots. A lot of people think that you can just start connecting the dots and draw these pictures. So let me pull something over to you really quick. Okay, so here's, uh, uh, my astronomy students are quite familiar with me using this, uh, this program that tracks the night sky. So here's the night sky and here's a bunch of stars out there. Can anybody just feel like they could connect some dots and, uh, and, and come up with some animal or a human or some, something? And the answer is no, you can't. Find, uh, um, let me see, right, well now I can't even see it, but you can't, you can't, you can't connect the dots, so watch this, if I go to view constellation illustrations, here, here's, uh, here's a few constellations. So like, here's a dog. I guess you got two eyes uh, and that's it. So that's my point. Uh, it's, the constellations are not connect the dots. There are pictures made. Uh-oh, what happened to my slides now though? Do I need to, can you I think you got, on? yeah, I think you have to turn it back over, sorry. But if you Either turn back it back over. over can, I just use, can I just use mine? Uh, if you have them, yeah. Yeah, okay, I have mine up, so let's do Go that. Go for it, yeah. Okay. So I'll just go like this. There we go. There's monitor. It's not connect the dots. Like right here, there's three there dots right here. And, and this is uh, Aries the lamb. <laughs> it's the tail of Aries the lamb. And that's it. Uh, okay. Some more constellations 101. There's 88 total constellations up in the sky now. But of those 88, only, four, only 48 of them are ancient. And then the other ones, the other 40 came out much, much later. So we're only concerned or uh, study the ancient ones, not the modern ones. 
And uh, here's just a quick list of the 21 that are above the ecliptic. The ecliptic is the path of the sun. Uh, so these are the northern, the northern constellations. You can take a quick peek and see if any of them uh, mean anything to you. We've got somebody, I just met somebody a couple weeks ago that named their child Lyra, L-Y-R-A, uh, named after a constellation. Cool. Uh, and of course, then there's the 12 famous constellations that you mostly are familiar with because they, law, they lie along the elliptic and, and uh, most people are familiar with uh, those 12. And then there are 15 below the, the ecliptic, the southern constellations. And uh, you can take a quick peek at them and see. Okay. So um, what were these constellations all about really quick? To the, to the ancients, there's no doubt that there is a story up there. There's probably a lot of, there's a lot of stories and all these pictures paint a story. And so, um, and maybe even a message uh, up there. And of course, if you've taken my astronomy class, you know that it's also a calendar and we've learned how the, how the constellations swing through the different seasons and there are certain constellations that are in the winter and there are certain constellations in the fall and so you can look at the constellations and know what season it is you can go you can mark your calendar by the constellations you know this is pretty cool too that the the constellations talk to each other they're they interact you know like pisces and uh oh i know i've lost i'm having a senior moment but pisces is a fish facing this way a fish facing this way and they're bound together on a cable and the, the, the tie, and the tie is, is connected to this guy, you know, and Aquarius is holding this, whoops, Aquarius is holding this uh, water, and it's going into the mouth of this fish, and uh, so there's quite a few constellations that do interact with a, one another, so there's a story up there, most of the story has been lost, but uh, Maunder helps us unravel some of the stories. Uh, but then um, the whole thing about constellations fell, uh, uh, fell away with astrology and divination and, to me, satanic. And, uh, and during that period of time, so much of what might have been in the ancients has been lost because it's, uh, it fell into a, this realm of astrology. And um, it's almost like uh, Satan kind of co-opted. Uh, the constellations. Uh, but are they still up there? Yes. And what's really neat is these pictures are pretty much the same as they now, as they were in the ancient times. There's almost very little to no change. The Romans, the Romans tweaked a little bit, but not much. And so they're pretty much the same. But they are um, still used in modern astronomy today, if I can get my thing back up here, watch this. If I go view constellation boundaries, so to this modern astronomy has very, has very distinct boundaries around all the constellations. And so if you were to take an astronomy class at college or just get involved in astronomy, they will be constantly mentioning uh, the particular event or this something is happening in Taurus or something is happening in Orion. Um, okay, so that's that. Let's uh, go to the next slide. Okay, really quick, I'll let you, I'll let you all in. What if you had an inquiring mind based on what I just told you that there's all these stories and pictures in the sky uh, that's been there since ancient times? What would an inquiring mind want to know? By the way, if those of you that have taken my class are familiar with the thinker, anybody? Anybody want to type in? What would an inquiring mind want to know? Just want to see what you say. By the way, hi, Joey. Kelsey. What are we up to? We're up to 19 students. What do they mean? Thank you, Rebecca. Good question. Thank you, Jill. How old? <laughs> how old? Are, just how old are the constellations? Good question. Thank you, Rebecca and Jill. Uh, two favorite students. Okay, let's uh, let's go. Yeah, if 
I would think you'd want to know who put them up there and when did they arrive and why are they there and what do they mean and, and uh, where, where did they get created? Who sat down and looked up at the sky and did that? So let's, if I have some time here, let's uh, try to answer some of these questions as fast as we can and have some fun with it. Again, I'm going with Maunder. Uh, we're going to answer the question when, right here. We want to answer, see I can have a pen now, Julie, thank you. Pointer options, pen. Okay, so we want to answer the question, when did these constellations show up in the sky? And so what Maunder shows in his book is he goes through the external evidence of every place, not every place, but the, the mention of the constellations as you go back into history. So you can see that we just keep going back, 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 back. Panius, Hesed, Homer, early Greek coins had, had the constellations, Babylonian boundary stones uh, had the constellations. And of course, we know that the book of Job uh, mentions the constellations, the Masoreth, the Zodiac, the uh, Orion, uh, the Pleiades. And so just from the external evidence, the constellations go at least to the 5, uh, 1500 BC. But he said, even when the book of Job mentions it, it's like, well, you know what I'm talking about. It's not like the book of Job introduces the constellations. They're already well known by 1500 BC. So that's as far as we can get from the external evidence. So then what Maunder did is he looked at the internal evidence. And I don't have time to teach this too too um uh, too deeply but the center and i hope you if you don't know this you know it now the earth wobbles you know it spins and it rotates and it's also wobbling and it takes uh, 26,000 years for it to wobble just once but what they did is they found the center this is a this is a chart of the constellation an ancient chart of the constellations and they take the center point and they were able to calculate back in time based on the Earth's wobble of just how long ago would these pictures have been up based on the center of this diagram here. And so that's how they determined how old the constellations are. And the answer comes up to 2700. Now it's not precise. It could be 2500, it could be 28 or 2900, but somewhere in that vicinity of time was the date of when the constellations had to have been uh, created. Okay, so that's one question we've answered. Uh, when did they arrive? 2700 BC. Let's go down to where. Where were they created? Can we figure that out? Well, it turns out what Mondor is saying, he's going back to the same part and he looks really closely at the, the bottom, the southernmost constellations the southernmost ones. And what we know is that latitude changes our view. Based on where you are on planet Earth determines how many stars you can see to the south. So for example, if you lived in Panama, uh, you're never gonna see the North Star <laughs> because uh, it's way too low for you to see. Um, and there's a lot of constellations that you may, that Australia gets to see that we don't get to, that we don't get to see. So anyway, those who have, again did the math and did the did the calculations came up with 40 degrees that the constellations were 2700 BC at 40 at 40 degrees north latitude. And this was kind of shocking when they first figured this out because if somebody had to guess, you know, where were where were these uh, constellations? Where were these people that put it up there? They would have guessed Egypt, way too south for Egypt, or maybe in Palestine. And a lot of people would have thought it was the Greeks, but it's even too far south for the Greeks to have done it. It had to have been way up here in uh, northern. Turkey. So 2700 BC, uh, somewhere around 40 degree north latitude uh, line is uh, where. So now we can try to answer the question, well, who did that? Who put all those pictures up there? And uh, I'm going to flip the side. I should have let you guys. Uh, Christy. Hi, Christy. How do the stories apply to us today? Only 
let me get to that. Let me get to that. Good question. Uh, oh, she had asked that earlier, probably. And that is, and uh, Maunder doesn't get too firm on this, but he does show us all the different uh, um, scientific understandings and biblical chronology of Noah and Noah's time on planet Earth. And it was, it changes a little bit, but we're in the same ballpark that Noah would have been around 2700 BC. And then we know that he landed in, uh, he landed in Northern Turkey. So um, it, it, it's just kind of fun <laughs> to think maybe Noah has something to do uh, with these constellations. Uh, so now we've got uh, who, Noah, maybe Noah's kids or, or grandkids. And now we come to the tough, the tough part, and that is uh, uh, what, what do they mean? Well, sadly, most of the meaning has been lost. But Maunder points and explains some of the constellations that are just too obvious to pass up. And so let me show you a couple of them that, uh, that Maunder, Maunder spent some time on. And that is, we need to go, this was tonight, the way. We spent some time, more time on this. The night sky right now is just too cool. You know, look a little bit to the west. This is eight o'clock at night. You got Venus, and then you've got Orion's belt and Orion's sword and Beetle, Beetlejuice up here uh, in Orion. And draw a line through Orion's sword, and you'll come to the our brightest star, Sirius. All that in the some other time. Let's go to tomorrow morning. Oh, I got to change it to hours. Let's go to tomorrow morning. Uh, well, here's, here's an interesting serpent with a raven eating off of the serpent. Does that ring a bell with anybody? And here's a, here's a, young, here's a young maiden holding on seeds and a branch. Does that maybe ring a bell with anybody? But we want to get to the here. Let me just, let me just here, the, here is a picture of uh, a man, and it looks, and, and there's this serpent, this snake that he's holding, and it's pretty obvious from the picture that he's trying to hold the snake back. Why does he want to hold the snake back? Well, it looks like he's, the snake is trying to reach up to this, and this is a crown. The snake is trying to reach to a crown, and this man is preventing the snake from accomplishing his mission. But at the same time, the snake the, in this picture, his foot is on the head of scorpion. His foot, let me repeat that, his foot is on the head of, of, of scorpion. But at the same time, and this picture doesn't show it as good as some of the others, but the scorpion's tail, the, the is ready to snap or bite or whatever a tail does to Orpheus's foot or heel. So there is there is just a lot going on in this picture. And does anybody uh, does anybody want to conjure up or not conjure? That's a bad word. Uh, think of a Bible. Does this depict anything biblical in your mind? Any Bible people out there that want to say, Tim, thank you, Tim. Genesis 3.15, um, God, God passing out judgment uh, after the fall of Adam and Eve. And uh, it, the Bible says, uh, he shall, how's it read? I, I, do I have it on a slide? I don't think I do. He shall bruise his head and you, Satan, will bruise his, he shall crush his head. That's what it says. He shall crush his head and then talking to Satan and you will bruise his heel. And so you, you have, in, the, in Genesis 3.15 is called the Proto-Evangelion, which is the first mention of, uh, in Genesis of Jesus, the Savior, the Savior of the world. And in that, in that verse, it's talking about the, the Son of God, as all the commentaries would agree, uh, and the, his fight with Satan. 
and here is a person crushing the head and about to get hit by the heel. But at the same time, he's holding back this serpent from acquiring this crown, which sounds like the, the cosmic battle that we know about if you studied scriptures between uh, God and the devil, the God and Satan. So, and then um, Maunder also mentions that this guy here, their heads are almost touching. Um, so it's, and, his, and he's saying it's probably the exact same person. It's just doing a different act. But look, he's got a club in his hand and he's about ready to club Draco the dragon. Draco. So again, you've got uh, somebody uh, hitting the head. And so, and here's, here's, <laughs> here's an eagle chasing a boy out. Um, so what's the, what's the bottom line? And I'm going to have, if I have time, I don't know if I do or not. Julie's going to be mad at me. Uh, Maunder intimates that the constellations seem to have been, uh, existed and came into existence and drawn up in the sky shortly after the flood and that it tells the story of the first 10 chapters of Genesis. Now, so much is lost, and we just don't know. Uh, but uh, there's, they're just, and I'm only pointing out a few of them, and I'm showing you that there's a ship, there's a guy coming off the ship, actually it's a centaur, and he's killing an animal, and the animal is going on an altar. And exactly what happened when Noah came off the ark, uh, came, came off and he sacrificed an animal to God. And uh, that seems to be depicted, uh, depicted in there as well. So uh, when it says the Bible declares the glory of God, it's very well that it's, it's, it's declaring for us the, uh, the first 10 chapters. Uh, pretty cool. Man, I wish I could be with you for a couple hours, but I'm going to, I'm just going to, knock you off your seat for just a second really quick you know how after the flood the, the god says I, I set my bow in the clouds and my entire christian life that's we teach that that's the rainbow right he set the rainbow in the clouds to remind us that he's not going to ever flood the earth again um but maunder maunder said instead of a bow like a rainbow he's talking about a bow like a bow and arrow and this arrow, this bow, is set right in the Milky Way clouds, if you're familiar with the Milky Way. And so he says that when God said, I set my bow in the sky, God is actually saying uh, Sagittarius, that it's Sagittarius' bow is uh, in the Milky Way. Uh, that was free. Not, not charging you for that one. Uh, okay. Let's uh, get out of this. I'm probably going way too long. What do they mean? Probably the first 10 chapters of uh, Genesis. Let's go again. And then uh, Maunder also, uh, let me see. So we got what, why, why are they there? Maybe I should answer that one. But uh, let's turn it out here real quick. Genesis talks about uh, the cherubim. Uh, he does, but Genesis doesn't explain what, what is a cherubim. And then in Ezekiel, he explains what a cherubim is, that it had the face of a lion and uh, the face of an ox and a face of, uh, the face of an eagle. Well, there's four of them. Had the, oh, a human. It had a human face, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. That's the cherubim that's mentioned in Genesis, again in Ezekiel. And then it's mentioned again in Revelation, the, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. Well, Maunder teaches us then the four corners of the sky, and I don't have time to teach you what the four corners are, but the four critical points in our sky, what do we have? We have a lion, we have an eagle, we have an ox, and we have a man. And so uh, fairly coincidental? Probably not. Okay. Uh, why are they why are they there? Here's this now I'm leaving Maunder and this is Gene Doremus talking. 
you don't have we didn't have the printing press we and noah noah got off the ark and he and and his family had these stories that have been going on for a couple thousand years since adam and uh how do you how do you capture those stories and save them for future generations and uh so i believe that adam's uh, kids kids or grandkids uh um took the stories that they brought with them on the ark and put them in the sky um and that's why i think they're there uh okay it's a cool book two of you are going to win it here in just a few minutes it's it's uh you can get an online version for free uh and believe it or not a student i don't think the student is here he might be a student from canada about five or six years ago is the one who turned me on uh, to this book uh, which is pretty neat okay bye Joey uh, it was wonderful seeing does anybody have any questions at all uh, that came to mind that uh, you the gene let me see do you have the book the genius of ancient man by don landis it has a short section on the constellations christy no i don't but i am going to write that down and today is a big day for me <laughs> i'm sharing being personal here i got my first social security check today my wife said did you check your bank account and uh my first ever social security check showed up today so i'm doing cartwheels you know i say my ship my ship came in uh, so I can just jump right on Amazon with my uh, retirement check and buy that book, Don Landis. Okay, just wanted to say hi, Leah. Thank you, Leah. <laughs> Boy, this is just so heartwarming to see all you folks show up. Uh, as you mentioned them now, do you think the Greek stories and names tie into those? No, not at all, Jill. I really don't. I think, I think the Babylonians uh, started perverting, uh, perverting them, and then the Greeks came up with their own set of myths um, based on those. The pictures stayed the same, but the Greeks turned them into myths. I, I don't know if they, if they have a link to what the ancient meanings were or not. And then when the Romans came along, they, they uh, created their own myths. So the Greeks had their mythology based on the constellations and then the Romans, uh, uh, but I don't think either one of them truly match up to the ancient Noah type meaning of the constellations, which would not have been a myth. It would have been a true uh, history of the first 10 chapters of Genesis. So cool, Jill. Thanks for asking. So just coincidentally happen to have different names on them. Yeah, I think so. And of course, you got the whole language thing going on too. And there, and uh, D. James Kennedy. If you anybody probably don't know D. James, he wrote a book about the. It's called the Gospel in the Stars, and uh, he looked at all the constellations and and was saying that the gospel of, is there. And, and he tried to go back to the, the stars and the original Hebrew name of the star and what that Hebrew name meant. Or, and so, yeah, there's, a, there's that going on as well. And I, I've studied it and I've uh, read the books and watched the videos on D. James Kennedy, but I just can't say that I'm first in his camp. <laughs> Uh, in the book, does it go through how the story matches each of the pictures and pictures in the sky? Uh, a little bit. And something, Julie, is that from Julie? Um, what we do in our class, Julie, and what he does is he goes back to 2700 BC because where the constellations are in the sky now is not is, is not the same as they were. Uh, what would that be? 4700 years ago. So we go back 4700 years. And there's more meaning there when you see the constellations and their original, when they were originally drawn up. But he does, he, he goes quite, he goes quite a bit. He, there's a lot, let me see, I think it's in the back of the book. Uh, the Astronomy of the Bible, look, if you can see it, five, five small pages of uh, Bible references. So huge amount of Bible references. From what I know, logistics, that is, that does make sense since Hebrew is a Semitic language along with the Arabic and a lot of star names are Arabic. 
Yes, Jill. And uh, Gospel in the Stars goes there. D. James Kennedy goes there. So cool. Uh, James Kennedy was, I just think it's called the, I've got it here somewhere. Hmm. Not put my hands on it, but it's called The Gospel in the Stars by D. James Kennedy. Um, okay. You know what, Julie? We can't have our reunion go too long because uh, I'm going to team works too uh, any minute now. <laughs> Yeah, so I know. You, me, have, you have another class, right? <laughs> but you know what? I want to just say the names, though, because it just uh, is such a blessed thing. Uh, and you go right ahead. Christy has turned into this dearest uh, friend and her, and her family. Uh, and Duncan, thank you for coming. And Georgia, and I don't know, Holly. Holly is Izzy. What a, what a friend, Izzy. Jasmine and Jill and Kelsey and Leah and Martha and McAllister, Caitlin. Oh, the whole family. The Caitlin, Cooper, and Katrina in Colorado. Thank you for coming. Um, Pat, I don't know. I don't know if I know Pat. And of course, uh, Rebecca, um, Christy's daughter, and Tim. So, you have blessed me beyond words this morning. I am just uh, doing cartwheels here. So, okay, we're going to have to say goodbye, though. Every every good thing comes to an end. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Thanks. This was so interesting. I can sit and think about this all day long. So I'm, I might order a copy of that book for myself. I don't there, know. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for enjoying our presentation with us. If you have any further questions, you can contact Lieutenant Colonel Jean Doremus here at Excelsior Classes. Jean teaches classes here at Excelsior and next Paul, he'll be uh, offering classic astronomy, exploring space, military history, aviation history, and World War II stories and analysis. So those would be offered during the fall and spring semesters. If you have any interest in having your students take those classes, please see us at registration at excelsiorclasses.com. Our next webinar will be held towards the end of March of 2020, and it will be presented by our architecture instructor, Melissa Kaiser. So I hope you'll join us for that presentation. For now, thank you again for watching, and we'll see you again here at Excelsior Classes.